Hello there, adventurers, and welcome to Wally DM. Today we're going to take a look at the top 10 iconic monsters in Dungeons and Dragons. Now, this is way too big of a task for me to do by myself, so helping me today is going to be 23 additional YouTube channels. Now, each YouTube channel has submitted up to five clips of about 30 seconds each, so you're going to see a lot of your favorite YouTubers throughout the video. Now this is going to be in an interview documentary style with each YouTuber giving a few thoughts on the monsters that are in this list. Now the monsters included in this list and their ranking was taken from Facebook groups, Reddit posts, forums, and other social media from over 2,000 entries. I mined all of the data out and this is what was the result. So I hope you enjoyed this collaboration of 24 different YouTube channels and let's dive right in. This is our top 10 iconic monsters in Dungeons and Dragons. The first iconic monster on our list coming in at number 10, the Rust Monster. My characters, like 90% of my characters I play are fighters. Fighters wearing chainmail, fighters wearing plate armor. If there is one creature that is the fighter's worst enemy, it is the one that can rust every item the fighter is holding. Now, rust monsters. Oh man, if you ever gave your party too many magic items, this is, this is the best fix. <laughs> All jokes aside, there's something so fascinating about a creature who survives strictly by ingesting inorganic matter. They derive all of their nutrients not by eating living things, but by eating metals and rocks. The party is adventuring through the Underdark Ori Tunnel and they run into this giant insect that is eating their armor and weapons. Rust monsters are such a classic iconic monster to throw at, especially low-level parties, where if they don't have magical weapons, they better not use them around that rust monster, or it's going to start nomming on them. Players are never really worried about being eaten by a rust monster. Getting their armor and their weapons, particularly their magic stuff, getting rusted and being useless, yes, they're worried about that. The problem is that one or two rust monsters are never a big issue, but if you have an entire herd of rust monsters chasing the party, then you get a situation which is a bit like the Benny Hill show, where everybody climbs on something nice and high, and you just watch them either running around or climbing up something uh, in a continual circle. They're kind of orange, rusty colored, big hind legs like a grasshopper, a tail, and these large antennas on it. The paladin bows up and says, I've got this, you guys stay back. And as he notices, the dwarf is really backing up. He goes right at it, hits one with his sword, and he kind of recoils as he sees his sword is starting to break in front of him. It, it has cracks in it. All of a sudden, one of the being one of the monsters hits it with his antenna and a foot cube wide of his armor, his brand new plate armor, just dissolves right in front of him. Now fear hits his eyes as he recognizes the terror of fighting a rust monster. Rust monsters are always going to make the melee party members cry as your weapons and armors are going to be damaged. The worst thing about them early on was not only would they damage you on their turn by biting into your weapons and armor, but even hitting them constituted having your weapons getting damaged. And this didn't only apply to mundane weapons. No, even magical weapons were damaged. So these things were just an absolute nightmare to deal with. Rust monsters are at their best in the lower levels of the dungeon because characters are going to survive an encounter with a rust monster. But after that encounter, when they no longer have a metallic weapon or their armor or their shield, and they realize that they need to go two or three levels back up to the surface without anything to protect or defend themselves, that is when the real fear and anxiety of the character and the player are going to set in. There's no end game for these evil wizards. Coming in at number nine, the Lich. I love throwing liches at my players. Not only do I get to have an undead that can think for itself, but it's so intelligent and has such a prolonged life that I can play it intelligently, that it knows what it's doing, knows how to counterplay, knows to take down the healer first or things like that. And it's got 20 levels in a spellcasting class, so I have the whole wizard spell list to play with to shut down my party, to have interesting counterplay, minions available. It definitely makes for an interesting encounter, and if your party's not used to fighting enemy spellcasters, why not start with one of the best? 
Liches to me are the scariest of the D&D monsters. There's just something about them. They're so incredibly creepy. You know, they can live for centuries as long as they're feeding souls to the phylactery. You know, they could bide their time. They could hatch a plan that could take literally centuries to finish and it would be okay with them. I mean, who wouldn't be terrified of that? My current campaign has actually got a good lich, someone that turned to lichdom for the greater good to protect their city from a curse and turn all their people undead until such a time that they could cure the curse or remove the curse and return their people back to the land of the living. Playing with those expectations of is the lich actually good or are they just pretending for some more nefarious purpose has been a lot of fun. You know, what is a lich but a spellcaster who's not done yet? And I think that's what makes it, you know, so, so terrifying and so, so fearsome is because it's relatable. Any adventuring character, regardless of their alignment, if they feel like strong enough that there's something they haven't done yet, lichdom is a possibility. It's the corruption that comes with immortality. That's so horrifying. Now, a puzzle lich, that would be fun. This high-level wizard that seeks immortality by becoming a powerful undead so he can continuously put locked doors and puzzles in the path of adventurers? Now that's my kind of lich. The lich is an expression of one of our deepest fears, that of our own mortality. This is an individual who has dedicated their entire life to keeping true death at an arm's length, while simultaneously harnessing that power to serve their own ends. Now while on the surface a lich may seem extraordinarily powerful, they are ultimately terrified of what waits for them should they be destroyed. There's no more frightened creature in the multiverse than a lich the moment before its phylactery is undone. And that desire to keep on living past one's own natural lifespan, along with the fear of what lies beyond, is extremely compelling and quite relatable. Liches are iconic villains. In the search for immortality, they sacrifice their humanity and become undead. And you can play a lich as arrogant, hyper-intelligent, and a powerful leader that no one, even death, could defeat. But there is a way to defeat a lich, and that brings us to what I think makes liches so iconic. They're powerful, but fearful. Despite the extremes they've gone to, death is still a possibility. You figure a wizard has spent his whole life trying to capture that feeling of what it's like to harness magic, powerful, powerful magic, and they become kind of addicted to that power and they want more. And so they need more time than probably their, their lifespan is going to allow. And so they do things and they, they study and they find these, these uh, forbidden magics that allow you to extend your life. And to heck with the fact that your, your body's all rotting and you don't look too good, but that's neither here nor there. And the important thing here is I have more time to practice my craft and as I get more and more powerful. And it's one step closer to my ultimate goal to be a god and be able to do anything that I want. Known for their cleverness in trap construction, coming in at number eight, is the kobold. Kobolds have got a weird history in D&D. They started off as goblinoids or a branch of the goblinoid species um, and then they turned into the familiar little reptilian dog boys that we know and now they're the fully draconic little lap dogs of true dragons. No I, I like kobolds uh, a lot. I like them more than goblins for some reason but uh, they were originally kind of the same thing and then kobolds evolved into this uh, smarter kind of but more cowardly goblin-esque type of creature but I, I think there's a line and people are either like really on a, a kobold side or a goblin side and uh, for me it's kobolds I just I'll always use them over goblins Kobolds are a classic pack monster. One kobold on its own, meh, not a problem at all. But you throw an entire horde of kobolds at them with ones that can fly and ones that can do breath attacks and some that are inventors and have centipedes on sticks. And that's pretty intimidating. 
So I feel like kobolds are mainly used as goons or as minions. This is cannon fodder that can be tossed at your heroes as they're approaching the boss. But the kobolds themselves are intelligent and savvy and resourceful. Uh, their god is trapped and inaccessible to them. They can trace their lineage to powerful dragons, but they find themselves always abused and enslaved just at every turn. There's a lot of story potential with kobolds, so I think you keep that in mind when they show up in your adventures. Kobolds have certainly changed drastically over the course of D&D's history, but we typically find that they are strong in number and they are tricksy. They don't engage in flat out open fights. They are going to skirmish, they're going to retreat, and they're going to utilize their base as a way to funnel the enemy into whatever fun traps that they have laid in this door. Kobolds love traps more than anything. If you were playing a kobold back in third edition, you actually came into the game with a bonus to crafting traps. It's just in their blood. They're, they come out of the womb ready to start crafting traps. Oh my god, kobolds are my favorite creature ever. They are adorable and silly and they are weak and they know it which makes them strong. The way they fight is not by tackling challenges head on, they lure you into their traps and when you know rocks collapse and wasps fall over you. What I love about kobolds the most is the opportunity they give you to just be silly, be stupid, be yourself, look like a fool, make yourself look like a fool. Like, I'm a kobold. One of my favorite things about kobolds is their affinity for traps. They're very clever in the traps that they design. And if you're a character and you see kobolds around, then you need to be extra cautious looking for tripwires and things of that nature. But if you're a DM or a GM, then get your trap book out because you have all kinds of ammunition to use against the characters. Kobolds are great. Uh, they are not your classic destructive monster. They kind of just want to do their own thing. And I love in how the book, uh, some local towns that know that there are kobolds around will just kind of leave them alone or maybe even try to parlay with them uh, by, you know, giving them tools and stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, having a kobold clan underneath your city is way better than having practically any other monsters underneath your city. Are they cute or are they deadly? Coming in at number seven on our list is the owlbear. Owlbears! Oh, the perfect synthesis between two alpha predators. And they sort of combine to create this just rage-filled thing which just attacks everything in sight. I think the best origin story of the owlbear is the one where nobody really knows how the owlbear came to be. Was it some weird magical experiment gone horribly wrong? You don't know. They're a very good thing to toss in and make battles chaotic. Because an owlbear will just take on anything. It'll take on a dragon. It, an owlbear, does not care. Owlbears are like quite simple really it's I mean it's a bear owl thing makes cool noises but what is it exactly is it, an, is it a bear that's also mixed with an owl is it just a flightless owl that is now the shape of a bear I don't know but either way mages have got to be stopped from making things like this the first time that I threw an owl bear at the party they didn't know what it was right and they just heard the name and went oh that's that's stupid <laughs> owl bear dumb name but then I put the token down on the table and it wasn't even any help because it was such a cute little token with a great little picture uh, that they were like, oh, it's so beautiful. We love it. And in fact, after the fight, my wife goes, hey, can I keep this token? And now she keeps that picture of the owlbear in her wallet, right? She doesn't have a picture of me in the wallet. She doesn't have a picture of the cat. She's got a picture of an owlbear. <laughs> owlbears? Yeah, I love owlbears. Big old piles of fur, feathers, beaks and claws. Scary, hairy tornadoes of pain. Uh, if you want to have some fun, have your party stumble across an adorable lost little cub and rescue it as a party mascot. Let them feel like heroes, but then big angry mama shows up a session or two later. What's the party going to do? Drama! People love owls, people love bears, and it seems like all players, if given the slightest chance, will try to tame and train owl bears as companions when they are meant to be these incredibly dangerous monstrosities. 
Ultimately, I think people just have a fascination for hybrid animals because it's the basis of so many mythological creatures, so you really just can't go wrong with an owl bear. If you don't already understand why owl bears are the best, I can't help you. Owl bears in Dungeons and Dragons. What a classic creature. You know, we usually see them as being this big bear creature, big size of a bear, and it's got this nasty beak and these feathers and all, but I kind of wonder what it'd be like if you mix it up a little bit and have it more owl than bear. So it's the size of an owl and the cute little size of an owl, but, but fierce like a bear and it, it's come, it swoops in at night. It hunts at night because it has great night vision and it hunts in packs. How would that do on a party? A party's like, yeah, we've faced owl bears before. We know what they're like. Do you? Do you know what they're like at night when they travel in packs and they swoop down death from above? Let's see how you do with that. I actually fondly remember the first time I encountered an owl bear, which was, I was about 15 years old then, and my dungeon master uttered the words owl bear. And I looked at him with a face saying, dude, I know we're playing a ridiculous game, but um, this is just getting way out of hand. And then he showed us the artwork. Uh, we battled the thing, we fought the thing, we defeated the thing. And ever since the owl bear has just become one of those creatures you bit against your players every now and then, especially new players who haven't really been into the hobby. Uh, they played like their third or fourth session and then you say the words owl bear. They will look at you with that same expression saying, dude, I know we're playing a ridiculous game, but this is getting way out of hand. And of course we have the new meme of the owl bear being relegated to sort of a uh, mascot monster where, uh, you know, they're not really taken as seriously. People, you know, envision them as like these fluffy, you know, adorable creatures. Uh, and yes, I, I did uh, sculpt my own owlbear hatchling miniature, but uh, you know, th this was because of a story reason. And uh, yeah. Oh, no, I don't know, owlbear hatchling. Oh, he's just so cute. He's just so cute. Oh, he's just so cute, owlbear. But yeah, I, I think people should, you know, take them seriously as monsters. Responsible for keeping the dungeon clean, coming in at number six, the gelatinous cube. I am not ashamed to say that I love the gelatinous cube. It is so silly. It's so dumb. I mean, it's this big invisible boy that just slorps along the corridors and it picks up all the rubbish. I mean, it's so stupid. Ah, oh, I love it. It's like a big fantasy Roomba. And somebody got paid to make that exist in D&D. That's why I love D&D. It's so silly. It's deadly jello. The gelatinous cube will slowly consume your party if they aren't paying close attention for this almost translucent, slow moving cube of death. The gelatinous cube is basically jello that tries to eat you. Now, unless you walk into it, it's not a big deal, and usually people get out and it's not a it's not to be something to be concerned with. But if you find a gelatinous cube, that is 30 foot by 30 foot and has 600 hit points, it's a totally different kettle of fish. And of course, I've seen characters die when they have to deal with a rather over large gelatinous cube that's spent a lot of time just eating everything. I love gelatinous cubes because it's one of those first iconic monsters that I used in Dungeons and Dragons. And I took a, a transparency from my work and I cut it up and I put a bunch of hot glue on it. I found some tutorial online. And the look on my player's face when I described the monster and then I was able to pull out this handmade mini and envelop him in a gelatinous cube, I'll never forget. So it's just a, it has a special place for me. My theory on the enduring popularity of gelatinous cubes is the sheer amount of tactile fun you can get out of them at the table. Obviously you have minis, and whenever we get a new set of minis, I always like to see how many of them I can fit inside one of these. <laughs> and um, But even if you don't have minis, you can do things like jello cubes and put candy skulls in them and then have fun smashing them up on your table and eating them afterward. The gelatinous cube is the classic Roomba of the D&D universe as they clear and clean up dungeons. They'll be picking up loose coins, potions, and whatever else gets dropped in the dungeon, but the real important thing is that they'll be picking up bodies of the people that they presumably slay. The fun thing about that is that there will be a skeleton walking around the dungeon, and when anybody goes to interact with this walking skeleton, they'll discover that it's actually a gelatinous cube. Gelatinous cubes are great because they're one of the monsters that only really makes sense in the context of tabletop RPGs. Like they're perfectly square, just big enough to fit in a gridded out dungeon hallway. And they're invisible, except you can see things floating in them. 
which doesn't make sense for any other type of monster except one that's meant to be a puzzle for players rather than an actual foe to fight. Gelatinous cubes are nothing if not iconic. These big blobs are great at blocking hallways, laying in pit traps, or cleaning dungeons. Just have fun with them. Hide one in a toilet for a wild surprise, or just plop them down out of the ceiling. I love that these are basically traps, just slurping around. Gelatinous cubes are just a staple of D&D, because they're, they're just scary. It's, it's basically a moving mound of acid. It moves slow, but in the right circumstances, that, that thing can be really scary. Uh, so what I like about it a lot is that you, just, you don't just throw a gelatinous cube encounter. You have to think about it as part of a trap or some other uh, mechanism to make things interesting. Individually weak, but strong in numbers, number five, the goblin. Goblins are so great because they have this bizarre hierarchical structure that is about getting ahead in every way you can. They go about it in different ways though, sure, but they are obsessed with the idea of being on top. While bugbears may seek to show you who is dominant through great feats of prowess, your typical goblins are obsessed with strength. If you can kill the leader, then you become the leader. Hobgoblins, on the other hand, actually have a quite rigid and formal political structure, but politics to them is just a fancier version of Goblin 1 smashing Goblin 2 over the head with their club. Goblins are cowards, pure and simple, and for good reason. It, a goblin doesn't fear death because it doesn't know what's on the other side. It fears death because it knows what's on the other side. Traditionally, goblins are survivalists. They won't get into a fight unless they have the upper hand, usually through an ambush and overwhelming numbers. But once a party of goblins becomes outnumbered, it's every goblin for themselves. Looking at the goblin boss in 5e, it has an ability called Redirect Attack, where it uses another nearby goblin as a meat shield. It's quite the selfish ability, but that's survival. Goblins are the best. They can take so many forms in the imagination, because historically, they were simply the little boogeymen who tamper with our stuff. And let's be honest, they've created so many adventuring characters by raiding helpless villages. You know, goblins are just the quintessential level one baddie. The very first game that I ever ran, uh, the players were infiltrating a goblin camp. You know, it's just such a classic uh, trope for a D&D game. And you know, the players, they captured a goblin, which I wasn't really prepared for. And then I had to voice this NPC goblin and give him a name on the fly. And I think I gave him the name of like, Gary or something because I couldn't think of anything else. So it was a, it was a very lofty start to my uh, dungeon master career. So there's a saying that the first encounter in Lost Minds of Phandelver is the single biggest cause of TPKs in all of fifth edition. And I think that's for good reason. Goblins are super sneaky. If you play them even at all strategically, they can demolish a party. A bonus action to hide or disengage. These little buggers can be brutal. Throw in a nil bog or two for pure chaos. If you're hiding in a dark forest, good night. And they have some of the best voices. Goblins make for some great comedic NPCs, as well as a great player option. In one of my games, one of my players was a goblin who was modeled after Dora the Explorer. They had a magical backpack, a map mimic, and they were on the hunt for one of their inventions named Boots. And this was a dark and serious campaign. And through collaboration, we made this silly goblin character feel like they belonged in the setting. Aside from dragons, goblins are, I think, one of the most well-known Dungeons & Dragons enemies. They're basically the de facto standard. And here with the 5th edition, they're a lot of players' first introduction to Dungeons & Dragons monsters, so they're so iconic, you can't help but think Dungeons and & Dragons and little green guys with pointy noses and sharp swords. Coming in at number four on our list is the ultimate monster trap, the Mimic. So I once managed to trick my party with an entire room of Mimics. I placed a piano in the room as an obvious trap. And when the players didn't fall for it and tried to leave the room, they found out that the door was a Mimic, the benches were a Mimic, all the pages on the floor were Mimics, and it was an incredible combat that made them very, very paranoid. Most of the time, Mimics are presented as a treasure chest or a door. But the truth is, is a Mimic can be anywhere. It can be a table, it could be a chair, it could be a character's backpack, 
backpack or a scroll that's within it. And the real fear in your characters and your players' eyes is going to be realizing that anything and everything that is around them could be a mimic. What I love about the mimic is the ability for it to be pretty much anything. They're not really a particularly scary monster to fight because usually somebody gets stuck to it, everybody moves back, they just pepper it with any kind of missile fire they can find, and then it's dead. But if you make a huge wizard tower, the mimic and everything inside it, that's a totally different story. Uh, mimics, I think that mimics are definitely uh, sort of relegated towards straight up monster fights when, I mean, these are creatures that can literally be anything. You know, mimics have a lot of potential in non-combat situations, puzzles, just like hazards. I mean, I, I wish people would use mimics more in non-combat because after the initial surprise is over, like a mimic fight is... They're, they're limited in what they can do. Can you imagine the feeling of going into the restroom, putting all your guards down, sitting, and then realizing that you're not only stuck, but the toilet is moving and making sounds because it's realized that lunch has arrived. Your lunch. Mimics, oh my gosh, let me tell you. Mimics are the best and easiest way to terrify your players. I mean, literally have them jumping at anything. We're used to the mimic, it's portrayed in a book as a treasure chest, and it's often used as a treasure chest. But imagine this, your players walk into an inn, it's a disheveled inn, but there's, there's light on inside, some kind of mystical light. The chairs that they sat in are mimics, the table that they sat in is mimic, and even the inn itself is a giant mimic. Think out of the box and enjoy using mimics. So you say intelligence is your dump stat? Well, let me introduce you to number three on this list, the Mind Flayer. Mind Flayers. I, I don't know. For some reason, they always feel more Dungeons & Dragons to me than uh, Lovecraftian, which is their origin. But the mystery still about Mind Flayers, and we know so much about their reproductive process and their history, but at the same time, within the Dungeons & Dragons universe, there's this why w w what creature evolved like this mind flares roll two of our oldest fears into one slithering tentacle faced package they are completely alien to us their ultimate goals are mysterious and they come from places most mortals can't even begin to comprehend one bad roll of the dice and you could even become one of them the fear of losing your humanity is one that when combined with the unknowable nature of the Mind Flayer is bound to leave an impression. I don't think there's any monster that my players are afraid of quite like a Mind Flayer. I've only deployed him a couple of times, but every time I've used a Mind Flayer, my players just run. As soon as one turns up, they lose their collective minds and they just book out of there straight away. They do not want to fight these extra dimensional illithid monsters. The genius of the design of the Mind Flayer for me lies within the cohesiveness and just overall integrity to the theme of the creature. Everything from their power source to their food source to their culture and almost religion all revolves around the mind. Also the image of some kind of Lovecraftian alien nightmare of an octopus on an alien weird purplish body that lives underground. That's just something that your players and you as a DM are never going to forget. And then also, there comes that thrill that you can't get anywhere else by destroying your players' characters by devouring and extracting the brains. Every race has beef with the Mind Flayers, especially the races in the Underdark. You'd actually be hard-pressed to find an Underdark race that doesn't have Mind Flayers somewhere in their history, whether they're escaped slaves or the, the result of some kind of psionic torment. Wherever a Mind Flayer goes, it's going to stir the pot. Mind Flayers are the alien invaders of D&D. They make great monsters in horror storytelling because of their theme of assimilation. They belong to one hive mind, and they want to increase its influence. If they capture you and don't eat your brain, they'll transform you into one of them. If you want to creep your players out, let them wander through a mind flare lair unimpeded and describe rooms with jarred brains, dissection tables, and pods containing creatures that used to be human. 
Oh, Mind Flayers by Gary Gygax. Um, first appearing in the first issue of the Strategic Review Newsletter in 1975. Roger E. Moore wrote an ecology for the Mind Flayers for Dragon number 78 in 1983. Bruce R. Cordell is the godfather of Mind Flayer lore. The Illithiad was published in 1998. And of course, Lords of Madness, the Book of Aberrations, written by Richard Baker, James Jacobs, and Steve Winter, published in 2005. And now we have Volo's Guide to Monsters in 2016. Coming in at number two is one of the most feared monsters in all of D&D, the Sphere of Many Eyes, the Eye Tyrant, the Beholder. Beholders are awesome. They are an iconic monster. There's a reason they're on the front cover of the 5th edition Monster Manual. And they just can terrify players so much. When they rely on spells and their magic items and to have that central icon just shut it down completely, and then on top of that, you've got the different eye beams, eye rays, and you have so many other different varieties of beholders that are out there, like the blood kiss and the death kiss and a lot of kissing for beholders. Ah, uh, beholders. You know, to me, beholders are probably the most quintessential uh, monster in, in Dungeons and Dragons, even more so, I would say, than, than dragons themselves. Uh, because dragons are throughout fantasy, right? They're, they're fairly ubiquitous, but Beholders are pretty unique to, to the D&D setting. Beholders are just such weird creatures, you know? They don't really have any comparison in the real world. They just kind of float around with their weird eye stalks. They're so alien and just, you know, their paranoid nature and kind of chaotic energy, I just think is really cool. And I've never run a Beholder fight, but I will be soon and I'm very excited about it. Get weird with beholders. Vertical spaces, legendary actions, layer actions, creepy regional effects. These all make this classic monster a real powerhouse. The anti-magic cone can wreck a full party of level 20 characters. A beholder can be one of the most challenging encounters in the game and also one of the most fun. Beholders have been with us for so long. Ever since they were little circles with eye stalks, it's just, you know, that ugly image, but they were there. A bit disturbing, still disturbing nowadays, and they are on the monster manual. It doesn't get a lot more iconic than that. Did you know that beholders dream other beholders? That's kind of weird. Look at that smile though, look at that smile. He's so happy to nullify your magic and disintegrate you. With most monsters in D&D, you can either hack it apart with a sword, or go ahead and cast a powerful spell and knock it down. But that is why the beholder is so dangerous. It could easily float overhead, meaning all of the melee individuals can't do anything about it, and it could simply stare at the wizards, and your party is going to have a terrible time of it. Now I understand that the Beholder is supposed to be the greatest nightmare Gary Gygax ever had. A great huge fleshy round beach ball with a huge eye, a gaping maw of teeth, and eye stalks that shoots rays at you. Oh. I have killed many player characters using a Beholder. The Beholder for me is the one thing that lurks in a dungeon, is always ready for you, it's magical, it knows you're coming, and it will just kill you if it gets the chance, and especially with the disintegration rate. Every time I do that, I roll extremely high and the player just get, gets turned into one big pile of ash and he just dies immediately and has to roll up a new character. Beholders are one of my favourite monsters to deploy, especially against a higher level party. That anti-magic vision really messes with a party who've kind of built themselves on the back of powerful magics by the time they get to 9th or 10th level. So throwing a Beholder at them is a really fun way to disrupt their usual suite of abilities and force them to come up with something new. And, and I guess I've been lucky, I, I haven't had to, uh, I've never had to fight one at, at my table anyway, until very recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago at our table, we ended up actually fighting against two Beholders at the same time. Our table is full of characters that are heavily optimized and we were peeing our pants. <laughs> we survived that fight, but by the skin of our teeth. I mean, um, you know, if it weren't for our bard, who happened to have enough, just enough um, spell slots left to unpetrify a, a couple of people, a couple of us would have just been left as statues, uh, you know, uh, for, for time immemorial. But uh, yeah, that was rough. Before we reveal our number one pick, a few honorable mentions on this list are the Displacer Beast, the Tarrasque, Orcs, 
the purple worm, the carrion crawler, and a black pudding. Ranking number one on our list and the most iconic monster in D&D, the dragon. Dragons are iconic to Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, there's so many. There's metallic dragons, at least 10 of them. There's chromatic dragons, even more of them. Gem dragons, seven of them. Lung dragons, eight of them. Planar dragons, 14 of them. Epic dragons, uh, catastrophic dragons, the elemental dragons, undead dragons, and all the lesser dragons, including the Lenorms, Drakes, Wivens. It's just so many dragons. What can you say about dragons? They're half the name of the game. There's a reason why they're so iconic. They're powerful. They're, in some instances, awe-inspiring, terror-inspiring. And I think this goes without saying, but every D&D player remembers the first dragon they encounter. Whether it's one they fought or one they interacted with, that moment sticks with them for the rest of their time playing the game. The game is Dungeons and Dragons, because dragons are the epitome of mythological beasts from cultures around the world. They can be greedy, they can be sneaky, they can be bold and wise, and whether as a teacher or a villain, dragons are always part of a good hero's journey. I mean, who's not going to be scared of a dragon? Anything that can fly is as big as these things are, breathes or has the kind of breath weapon they have, claws, teeth, wings, you name it, but heck, if you're really going to make things interesting, just picking them up and dropping them from a high distance is one thing. But uh, I always find it really strange that some players don't run away. When I think of fantasy, the first thing I think of are dragons. And there is such a wide variety of different elemental types, as well as the fact that they can both be adversaries as well as allies. And it is called Dungeons and Dragons. Dragons, it's in the name of the game, Dungeons and Dragons. Interesting thing though, in the very first edition of D&D, dragons did not roll to attack with their breath. They would deal damage equal to the number of hit points the dragon had, meaning a fight with them was incredibly scary. You would try and hit the thing as hard as you can because those breath weapon attacks could easily kill you on that very first round. To be a fully grown and ancient dragon is to be an apex predator in a world of monsters. They are unmatched in physical prowess as well as capacity for knowledge. What I think makes the dragon so compelling is that it represents an impossible challenge to overcome. Dragons rightfully possess hubris in the extreme, and being able to overcome the insurmountable odds of doing battle with a dragon is the stuff of legends. Everyone loves a good underdog story. Ah, few monsters are as universal as dragons. I love the huge range of power between the different stat blocks. This gives us awesome versatility and you can use a dragon as a one-off flyby encounter all the way up to a campaign spanning BBEG. Use those layer actions, those regional effects, and those legendary actions to terrify your players with these living forces of nature. The dragons in D&D have always been such dynamic uh, monsters. I mean, I mean, obviously, I think they have much more potential as NPCs. But it's amazing how many dragon fights I have seen, where the dragon just kind of wanders in, plops down, and then just doesn't move. So why don't they use their movement more? Most dragons can burrow, they can swim, they can fly. Dragons have wings. In my opinion, the dragon fight should perhaps be a quick thing where in the first encounter, the PCs realize how mobile the dragon is and how they will have to make this a much different fight than their average fight. I think dragons will always inspire fear and awe in your players. Because regardless of whether a dragon is good or evil, a dragon is an embodiment of power. If you describe to your players that they see a massive winged creature breathing flame off in the distance, they're going to get nervous. Even if you are, have a campaign going that isn't around dragons, isn't built around dragons, and there's not really dragons in the storyline or, or, or everything, I just believe that having a dragon or a dragon-like creature in there every now and then just makes it the kind of fantasy that it needs to be for me personally. We're playing in a fantasy world and there are dragons in this world. There's no better creature to make a a campaign or make a world feel or feel more magical than a dragon 
So that was my top 10 list for the most iconic monsters in Dungeons & Dragons. Now be sure to leave a comment below and let us know what monster is iconic to you in all of D&D or Pathfinder. Now there was 24 different YouTube channels that were represented here. You probably are familiar with some of them, but I hope that I introduce you to a few new channels that you can check out soon. Now all of the YouTube channels have a link in the description below that's going to go to their channel. Please go over and show your support and subscribe to each and every one of them. And to all the YouTube channels that submitted clips for this video, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This was a, a fun project and I absolutely enjoyed everyone's comments on the monsters and thank you for trusting me to put this together. So that's all I have for you today. I'm looking forward to the comments below. Let me know what you think of the top 10 monsters and also what you think of this massive collaboration of two dozen YouTubers. Thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you in the next video and on to the next. Wally, this list seems incomplete. Where's the flail snail? Where's the flail snail? Come on, where's my big bummy knocker boy?